Let's move to our, our last uh, speaker, our keynote speaker, and closing address. Michael Weber, who is the Chief Science and Technology Officer at NNG. Michael Weber is based in Paris, so we really appreciate uh, him joining us. It's getting late in the evening there, so thank you, Michael, for sticking with us. It, as uh, in his capacity as the Chief Science and Technology Officer at NG, he, um, he is responsible for uh, global energy and infrastructure. He is the Josie Centennial Professor in Energy Resources at the University of Texas at Austin. His expertise spans research and education uh, at the convergence of engineering, policy, and commercialization on topics related to innovation, energy, and the environment. His latest book, Power Trip, The Story of Energy, was published uh, on May 7, 2019 by Basic Books with a six-part companion series that aired on PBS, Amazon Prime, and iTunes starting Earth Day 2020. His first book, Thirst for Power, Energy, Water, and Human Survival, which addresses the connection between the Earth's most valuable resources and offers a hopeful approach toward a sustainable future, was published in 2016 by Yale Press and was converted into a documentary by Alpheus Media. He was selected as a fellow of the ASME and as a member of the fourth class of the Presidential Leadership Scholars, which is a leadership training program organized by Presidents George W. Bush and William J. Clinton. Weber has authorized more than 400 publications, holds six patents, and serves on the advisory board for Scientific American. A successful entrepreneur, Weber was one of three founders in 2015 for an educational technology startup, Disco Learning Media, which was acquired in 2018. He holds a BA, a BS and a BA from the University of Texas, Austin, an MS and a PhD in mechanical engineering from Stanford University. Michael, thank you for joining us. We're very honored that you could make it here today. Uh, many of us have seen your and read your, uh, you've seen your documentaries and read your books. It's a real honor for us to hear from you firsthand uh, and we'll look forward to your presentation. That's great, thank you so much. And as you said, I'm in Paris right now. I'm in a hotel room, so, but I've got a view from my hotel room of the Eiffel Tower. I wish you could see what I'm looking at now with the sunset lighting it up, which is quite nice. And I got a chance to hear Shalini's comments, which are really interesting, and really fascinating. So Shalini, if you're still listening, I want to take you up on your offer for a visit. I want to come visit you at some point and learn more about what your research program is, because that's a great interest to me as a fellow professor, but also for NG, which is a large energy and infrastructure services company. I'll talk a little bit more about that. So a couple comments just about the energy world as I see it. There are a lot of trends afoot that will affect the kinds of decisions we have to make right now. The six demographic trends that are really driving the energy system right now are population growth and economic growth along with urbanization, industrialization, electrification, and motorization. So th these are the six fundamental drivers of what's happening with energy in that there's population growth, which means more people, and each person wants to consume energy as well as food and water and land and this kind of thing. There's economic growth, which means each person, as they get richer, is consuming even more of those things than they would if they were poor. And that's mostly a good news story, but there's some bad news there as well if we're not careful. And then there's urbanization and industrialization, which means we're moving from farm to factory, from small town to large city. There might be some counter trend on that temporarily from COVID, but generally speaking, the story of urbanization has been afoot for hundreds of years, and I don't think that's going to stop anytime soon. And then there's electrification and motorization, which is as we get rich and as we change our services and sectors and different makeup of the economy, electricity and mobility become desired things. The fuel of the rich is really electricity, so that's really something that everybody wants, and it's the greatest pathway to affluence and prosperity. And then mobility is one of those great outcomes where we like to move around when we're rich, and moving people and goods around is one of the ways we can get rich or have prosperity and security because of global supply chains and other things that are enabled by, by energy. So these are the six fundamental drivers of energy, these six demographic trends. There's more of us getting richer, moving from small towns to big cities. We're going from farmers to factories, as well as desiring electricity and mobility. And that means everything's changing for energy. We're changing how much we consume, we're changing what we consume before, and we're also changing the types of fuels we use. So the quantity, the quality, and the, the nature and application of energy is all changing at the same time. So this creates a massive energy transition. Those are the demographic trends. At the same time, we have three technology trends that are afoot. One is the trend towards efficiency, 
using less mass and less energy for particular goods and services. So it takes less energy today to operate a light bulb or to move a car or to cool a room, that kind of thing. So we're becoming more efficient, which is good news. We're using less of stuff to get the particular outcome we want. The second trend is the increasing information intensity. We're using more data and more information to achieve the same goals we used to achieve. And that's actually one of the reasons why we have more efficiency is because of the information intensity. So the energy intensity is dropping, but the information intensity is increasing. These are counter trends. The third technical trend is the increasing decentralization or decreasing centralization of energy, but it happens for other sectors as well. And by that, I mean, instead of having just a large power plant far away and then moving the power to the city, we might have localized energy production with rooftop solar panels or local fuel cells and community energy communities and this kind of thing. So we're, we're changing the way we move our energy around. And by the way, we're doing the same thing with healthcare, with telemedicine. We're doing the same thing with manufacturing, with 3D printers instead of factories. So this rise of decentralization is unique because it changes the way we allocate our capital, what we build and where we build it. So the six demographic trends have these three technology trends of efficiency, information intensity, and decentralization all wrapped up in this two-sided challenge, which is how do we increase resource access? How do we increase energy access? At the same time, we decrease its impacts. This is a challenge. There's a billion people in the world who don't have access to electricity today. There are three and a half billion people who don't have access to reliable electricity. So there are two and a half billion people who have access to electricity, but it's not very reliable, not as reliable as what we experience in Paris or in the United States. So this is a challenge. How do we increase the energy access for those who don't have it? But we also have to decrease the impacts from those who do have access because of the accumulating effects of the environmental pollution on land, water, and the atmosphere. So this is the challenge. In particular, as we accumulate carbon dioxide or other greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, it has long-term consequences on everything else because it accelerates and intensifies the hydrologic, hydrologic cycle. So it affects the way the water flows, affects where we get rain and snow and drought and heat waves and this kind of thing. So there's a lot of problems with our energy consumption that we have to solve. In just saying to those billion people that they cannot have access to energy is not a moral or humane or appropriate solution. We must increase that energy access, but decrease the impacts for them, but as well as for those of us who have a lot of access. This is the challenge I live and breathe at Engie. Engie is a global energy company. We're in 70 countries. We are the largest independent power company in the world. We also sell a lot of gas. We sell a lot of energy efficiency services. We want access to those new markets from a corporate view to to sell more energy to people, but we also have a philosophical mandate to decrease our carbon emissions. And as a company, we are rapidly decarbonizing. We've actually cut our carbon dioxide emissions about 50% in the last four years, which is really incredible for an energy company to do. And so we're, we're living this. And then in my role as Chief Science Technology Officer, I run the research programs. This becomes my research mandate. How do we decarbonize in a way that's robust, resilient, sustainable, affordable, scalable? And we can't just um, do the same thing we've done for decades. Some of the easy, obvious solutions are to shut down dirty, outdated, inefficient coal plants and replace them with natural gas, wind and solar, that kind of thing. Keep your nukes and hydro and geothermal wherever you can. So that's kind of the obvious first steps. And that's what the United States is doing with cheap gas, wind and solar, and also what the United Kingdom is doing. So the UK and the US are actually decarbonizing as time goes on, which is great. That's also the easy part. After you shut down coal and build cleaner stuff, the next parts become harder which is decarbonizing transportation and industry and home heating. So maybe you can electrify a lot of our mobility with light duty vehicles, the surface vehicles like cars. Maybe we can electrify building heating and cooling. And so that will help. But then what do we do for the really heavy industrial loads or the heavy duty aviation, marine and shipping? And what do we do with buildings that have already been around for a couple hundred years where it might not be so easy to electrify them because they have gas pipes? This is the problem we live with. And this is, becomes the, the research agenda, which is how to decarbonize heat, how to decarbonize fuels, how to decarbonize gases. And this means things like biogas and synthesized methane from hydrogen in hydrogen as a fuel or other hydrogen carriers like ammonia and methanol. It means things like batteries and storage to accommodate more variable renewables on the grid like wind and solar. It means non-variable renewables like geothermal and biomass and hydro where you can do it if it makes sense. So we have to do all these things rapidly because every year we delay, it makes the challenge a little more difficult and become more expensive to deal with the consequences of climate change and also more expensive to mitigate. So we're in a foot race to solve this. 
And I can tell you, even though I run the research program at one of the largest research portfolios in clean energy in the world at a very large energy company, it's not enough. This is too big a problem for any one company. It's too big a problem for any one country. And so we have to have all sorts of collaboration from company to company, country to country, and also sector to sector, because the energy sector is becoming much more integrated with the mobility sector and the healthcare sector and the building sector. They're not just customers for what we sell anymore. They're actually a part of the solution. So we have to have a lot more collaboration and a lot more um, activity together in integrated fashion to solve this. We're not going to get there just with one entity at a time. That's that's my view. And so we've been pushing for that energy to do more collaboration. Now we're collaborating with the Googles and Amazons and Dell technologies of the world. You might have seen their announcements about net zero over the lifetime. Well, we're often a partner for that. And we're also even looking at companies that used to be our competitors like Shell or our providers like Siemens and General Electric are getting into this business more and more. So I think the traditional fault lines that define where one industry ends, those are getting fuzzier because we're all moving into each other's spaces. And this creates all sorts of disruptive opportunities, but also unique potential to really solve the problem. So that's kind of my view of this. And I'll just close by saying that the same kind of thinking that got us into this problem of polluting too much and not dealing with the, the problems, the emissions or other waste streams from energy, they're not going to get us out of the thinking that we got us into that. It's not going to get us out of it. So we have to get some new thinking. And in particular, we need long-term global thinking. If you take the long-term view, the tension between the environmental answer and the economic answer goes away. So today, the economic solution, the cheap solution might not be the same as the environmental solution. The, the environmental solution might be triple pane windows or a more efficient car or a more efficient air conditioner, which usually costs more upfront, but then it saves you money over its operational lifetime. And so if you go far enough into the future, the environmental answer and the economic answer converge, they are the same. So if we have long-term thinking that really helps, and if we have global thinking that really helps because the problems are now global nature, the, the pollution we used to emit would be damaging to the ecosystem of the people right at the point of pollution. But now with climate change, the pollution happens in one place, but the people who are affected live halfway around the world and haven't been born yet. So this is a unique kind of environmental challenge and policy challenge. But if we take global long-term thinking, we'll get there and that's what we need along with all this collaboration. I really appreciate you having me on to, to talk about that. I'm happy to sort of answer any questions there are any. And a great conference, really appreciate this. Thank you so much. Michael, thank you for a tremendous uh, and thoughtful discussion of uh, the research agenda and the challenges that uh, the global energy community and global society as a whole face. Um, I have one question for you. I didn't see any coming from the audience, but um, as, the, uh, as the chief science and technology officer for a, a very large company that's doing business in many countries around the world, I wonder if you could talk about um, whether there needs to be a separate research agenda for those countries that are uh, developing and with economies in transition that face a completely different set of uh, constraints in terms of adopting clean energy technologies. Um, I work in Eastern Europe, for example. Uh, their uh, coal is not only an inexpensive fuel, but it's a huge uh, source of employment. Other countries of the world, around the world have different problems that they're dealing with. Oftentimes, we're looking at advanced technologies in the United States and Europe that may not be affordable in these countries. Does there need to be a separate agenda that is championed by uh, what I would call, when I was growing up, the old North-South energy debate that's by the South and looking at technologies that are more appropriate and affordable for them and, and support from the North to do that? This is a great question. There's a whole sort of field of study on the political economy of coal, for example, because it is a major employer in places like Poland and Vietnam and China. And this is important. If you're going to shut down coal, you get the same labor disruption that we get in the United States, by the way. But at a different scale, in the United States, we have 50,000 coal miners. In China, it might be millions, right? So the, the level is different, and that has a, a big effect on what kind of decisions are made. The other thing is, in many of those countries, that resource might be the domestic secure resource, and they have energy security concerns just like we do in the United States elsewhere about imported energy. So you have to look at what are the other locally appropriate or available resources, and many of these places do have other resources. It might be sunshine, wind, water, soil, biomass, geothermal, you name it. There's, there's a lot of resources in different places. And if there are no resources locally, which actually does happen in countries like Japan, which does not have a lot of energy resources, they import a lot, 
what can they do? That's why they pushed so hard for the plutonium economy, but then with Fukushima that changed their views, so now they're importing coal and natural gas. So there are some island nations that really don't have many options, but most regions have some option. And then it might be these other problems, like you mentioned, are, are there uh, transparency of governance problems or access to capital problems or know-how among the people to do this? Well, there might be opportunities to really think about uh, training people or getting access to capital, that kind of thing. There are multinational institutions like the World Bank or IMF or people who help on that. There's also the philanthropic community like the Rockefeller Foundation. Actually, I've got a call with them later tonight. We're really thinking about access to energy with the Rockefeller Foundation. And what do we do about access to energy? Because it is expensive in the United States to build a $12 billion nuclear power plant. Well, that's really expensive in some sub-Saharan African countries. It's not even feasible. And so what can you do at a smaller scale? And by the way, that scale is not only appropriate for the capital, but might be appropriate for the loads. So we can design a different solution. I think the West or the North, depending on how you say it, has a role to play in exporting know-how and technology. And this might be a pathway to peace, elevating people out of poverty, but also becoming a great good neighbor thing to do for America, for example, or a way to make money as well, because the people will pay for this technology. So I think we can look at it as a way to get cleaner options, as well as achieve foreign policy goals, lift people out of poverty, protect the climate. There's also things we could do once but only for collaborative. It can't be um, something where we know best and we have to shove the answer on anybody. It has to be really from the ground, building capability with our stakeholders there. What a great, uh, what a great sentiment to end our, uh, our forum on. Uh, I think you encapsulated uh, the philosophy that Barry had uh, championed at USEA for so many years. The idea that um, that uh, American or Western know-how can be applied in in countries, but that uh, the solutions have to be organic and fit the circumstances uh, of the countries at hand. But that, uh, from a political perspective, from an economic perspective, there are many benefits to the United States for helping countries overcome these serious challenges that you've discussed. I want to thank you uh, on behalf of the USCA and and the forum for joining us. I know you're you're uh, extraordinarily busy and ran a little bit behind schedule so thanks for staying with us very thoughtful. no problem and in honor of barry happy to do it really appreciate the uh, sort of the invitation and i'll be thinking about him and appreciate what, everything he's done thank you so much well with that i'm